Hi, I'm Hoche. Welcome to my channel, Tiny Bench. I hope you're doing well wherever you are in the world. In this video, I'm going to show you how I restore a Macintosh MC225. I'm going to show you what I do to it, why I do it, and the effect that it has on the sound. I am also going to show you the parts that I use, which are handpicked. The first thing that I do when I work on an amplifier is a visual inspection, and I was impressed and shocked by the pristine condition of this amplifier. The tube sockets show no sign of heat at all. The cloth on the wires of the transformers look absolutely brand new. I have never seen one in this condition. These pots look absolutely brand new. These imperfections are from uh, the manufacturing and are perfectly normal. After a visual inspection, what I do is I measure each and every resistor to make sure that it is within specs. Incredibly, I went through the entire amplifier and only found one bad resistor. But to keep it symmetrical, I went ahead and replaced the same resistor on the other channel. Because I am using a different type of resistor. So these are all the stock resistors from the factory. It is practically impossible to find an amplifier with all the original resistors in perfect conditions. This type of resistor carbon composition can go up in value simply when you solder it in. So that's why I replace it with metal film, which are extremely quiet, reliable, and these have a 1% tolerance. I only use carbon composition in the audio path. As expected, the electrolytic capacitors were dried out, out of spec, leaking, and had to be replaced. And that is perfectly normal. Electrolytic capacitors will go bad even if you don't use them. As a matter of fact, they will go bad faster when not in use. Because when they are subjected to a voltage, they reform. And they will actually last longer when they have a voltage than when they don't have a voltage. And actually, sometimes people rehabilitate a bad electrolytic capacitor by simply subjecting it to a voltage. They uh, apply a voltage and then gradually increase that voltage until they bring the capacitor to its operating voltage and they can get a little bit more life out of that capacitor. I like to replace capacitors. I like to use new capacitors, which are much better than the old capacitors because of advance advancements in technology. All the electrolytic capacitors have been replaced and that was done before I worked on the amplifier. Now these were okay and I left them as they are. However, there were a couple of capacitors that I did not approve of and I replaced. Over here, the previous person had used Jamicons. So I went ahead and replaced them with Nichicon audio bipolar capacitors. These capacitors are excellent. They are very transparent sounding, very musical, and they have a dramatic impact on the way that the amplifier sounds. Based on my experience, every capacitor has a different sound. Every capacitor sounds totally different to me. Everyone that has ever heard an amplifier after I work on it agrees that uh, the capacitors make a dramatic difference in the sound. Some people think all capacitors sound the same. I understand that it sounds the same to them, but they sound totally different to me. Right here on the power supply, there is another capacitor that I replaced because the previous person that worked on the amplifier not only used a generic capacitor, which is absolutely unacceptable, but it was also the wrong value. I went ahead and replaced it with a very nice Nichicon capacitor, which is one of my favorite brands. And I used a much higher voltage than the original. These are, I think, 12,000 hours or 10,000 hour capacitors. So, you know, it would be very, very reliable. And I like that. This is the power supply. So that's why it is a, a power supply capacitor and not an audio capacitor like I use on this other spot. Oh, and by the way, the capacitors that were on this spot were also the wrong value. These are supposed to be 100 microfarads and the previous uh, technician had used 330. In some cases, it is okay to increase the capacitance and I do it 
but whenever you have a capacitor in the audio path or it is the cathode capacitor of a vacuum tube it is extremely important to maintain the same value because changing the value can have a negative effect on the frequency response of the amplifier and have a negative effect on the sound quality of the amplifier it can basically shorten the bandwidth of the amplifier on this spot over here, we had a polyester 0.47 microfarad capacitors. These are very resilient, but let me show you, it was already out of tolerance. It's supposed to be 0.47 and it's measuring already 0.56. Next on this spot over here, there was a bumblebees and the bumblebees based on my experience are always bad electrically leaky and this one was literally leaking oil all the oil had come out of it here's a picture of the capacitor leaking oil before i removed it so i replaced that with a cornell uh, doublier polypropylene capacitors uh, 630 volts I realized the meter was not in view when I measured this capacitor from the power supply. So let me measure it for you. It's supposed to be 0.47 microfarads and it now measures 0.56. So that is considerably out of tolerance. And this is the bumblebee that was leaking oil and it's supposed to be 0.01 microfarads. It now measures 0.02 microfarads, which is 100% out of tolerance. It is literally leaking oil physically and it is electrically leaking as well. So you be the judge whether you should replace your capacitors or not. And moving along, the last capacitor on the power supply on this location, we had another bumblebee that I replaced with a Cornell Doublier polypropylene 630 volts. The value is 0.01. This is the bumblebee that was in that location. It's supposed to measure 0.01 and it now measures 0.15. So as you can see, way out of tolerance, garbage. Next in line, let's go over these two capacitors and these two capacitors. These are coupling capacitors between the two tubes of the pre-amplification stages. They are supposed to be 0 0.047. They were bumblebees. These were very good capacitors uh, back in the day and uh, sound uh, beautiful. Unfortunately, they are now garbage. Let me show you. As you can see, they are more than 100% out of tolerance. So that starts affecting the bandwidth. It starts acting like a low pass filter. These are coupling capacitors. It is very important for them to be within specs. These things are now garbage. And of course, the problem often is that uh, people take the, their amplifiers to a technician and it sounds worse after. And of course, yeah, if you have a technician that puts the wrong capacitors, yeah, they're going to sound even worse than these ones that are already garbage because they, they you know, you have uh, technicians that think that all capacitors sound the same and they put some capacitors in, in their place that will make your amplifier sound horrible. And I agree, you can actually make it sound worse than with these capacitors that are out of tolerance. However, if you know what you're doing, you can get your amplifiers to sound better than when it was brand new. Moving along, we're almost done. These two capacitors over here and these two capacitors over here are the coupling capacitors for the output tubes. This is what was in their place, 0.25 polyester. These are infinitely better. The Russian paper and all capacitors are infinitely better than these, even when these were new. But let me show you, let's measure one, 0.25 microfarad. They are now 0.345. So as you can see, out of spec. And by the way, these are fluke multimeters and I have three and they all concur and uh, the new capacitors measure spot on. So this is not instrument error. I will show you how new capacitor measures spot on. Let's move on. Next in line, we have these two capacitors over here and these two capacitors over here. They are part of the audio circuit, but they are not in the audio path. So in this location, we had more of these polyester capacitors and I replaced them with, made in Germany, Wima polypropylene 
audio capacitors. These capacitors are made for audio equipment and they are excellent and they sound absolutely fantastic. They are, in my opinion, much better than these ever were, even when they were brand new. And finally, we have these two capacitors over here. They used to be bumblebees which I replaced with Russian paper and oil. These are very important capacitors because the audio signal comes into the amplifier, flows through this into the first vacuum tube. Let me show you how you read uh, this bumblebees, uh, just like a resistor. So just like a resistor, you have brown, black, yellow. These two bands are the tolerance. Brown, which is one, black is zero, and yellow is four, so you add four zeros. So you have 100,000 picofarads, which is 0.1 microfarads, or 100 nanofarads. Look at that. That is 350% out of tolerance, and this one, it doesn't even hold the value. That is horrible. Absolutely horrible. You know, I hope this uh, helps uh, some people decide whether they should replace the capacitors in their audio equipment or not. And I think also people should be careful who they take advice from. These were very good in one day, but they are now garbage. They're now 56 years old. So the vintage capacitors are horribly out of specs, leaking DC voltage, and some of them literally physically leaking oil from the inside. Let's measure some new capacitors. This is a, a Russian paper and oil, and it's a 0 0.01 microfarad. So it should measure around 10 nanofarads, plus or minus 10%. Look at that, right on the dot. This is a uh, Illinois capacitor by Cornell Duvalier. It is uh, 0.33 microfarads. So it should measure around 330, plus or minus 10%, 331 right on the dot. Here's a Wima capacitor, MKP10. This, are, this is an audio grade capacitor. It should measure 470 plus or minus 10%. Look at that, 469. Spot on. The meter doesn't lie. Some shops are not going to be inclined to replace every capacitor in the unit because they will lose you as a customer. They probably don't want the amplifier to last you for the rest of your life because, again, you know, they don't want to run out of customers. They just, you know, some of them, they just want to replace whatever has completely failed and leave the rest in so that you come back next year. And uh, also, I understand that uh, sometimes, you know, people don't have uh, the money to do it all at once. I understand that, uh, you know, a job like this, it's probably twelve, fourteen hundred dollars $1,400. And uh, I know, you know, not everybody have the money to do it at once. But you know what, if, that, in the, if that's the case, you can do it by parts. You can do the electrolytics first, then do the coupling, then do the rest. I understand replacing, you know, the, only the resistors that are uh, out of tolerance. I understand it. I, I do that. But when it comes to capacitors, it, it really is worth, in my opinion, to just replace them all. In the long run, I think you save money if you do it all at once. And by the way, this amplifier was serviced by an authorized Macintosh shop. So be careful where you take your amplifier, you know, ask questions. You should be asking questions, you know, what, what are you going to put in there? You know, make sure that you want quality parts from uh, reputable uh, manufacturers and purchased from reputable vendors like DigiKey and Mauser. Once I was done with the restoration, I went ahead and cleaned these two pots with the oxid. I also went ahead and deoxid this switch and I added a little bit of the oxid to all the two pins and sockets. And I'm going to show you a trick of how I do it without making a mess. I also cleaned the RCA inputs. This is not a tube pin and socket cleaning procedure. It is just preventive maintenance for a tube socket that is working properly. I put the oxid in a dropper. I don't like the spray. This stuff is very toxic and I don't want it going everywhere. I don't want to inhale it. I don't want to make a mess. So, and this is what I do. I just insert the pin into the dropper. As you can see, it is completely submerged, but it's not dripping and it's not making a mess. It is not going anywhere, everywhere. So I go through all pins like that. 
It adds enough dioxide to prevent corrosion, establish a good contact, and again, it doesn't go everywhere. It doesn't make a mess. Okay, so that was all nine pins. And it will also help you facilitate the uh, insertion and removal of the vacuum tubes, which sometimes can be difficult. So I install it and remove it two, three times. Okay, and that is pretty good preventive maintenance. It adds a little bit of the oxide to the uh, two pins and the sockets without making a mess. The output two pins don't fit into the opening, but I can still very carefully add a little bit of the oxide again without making a, a mess. It is not visible in the video, but that the oxide actually distributes itself evenly across the surface of the tube pin, leaving a very thin film. I know that it is impossible to appreciate what it sounds like over a YouTube video, but just for fun, I am going to uh, play it for you. I'm going to play some copyright free music from Mozart Symphony Number no. 40 in G minor. I hope you like it. Here we go. As a result of the restoration, the sound became completely unveiled out of the system and in the air. The sweetness, the warmth, that rich tonality, the rich harmonics that was retained, we only unveil the sound. If you like this video, I would really appreciate it. If you like and subscribe, leave a comment. And I wanna thank you very much for joining me and coming along with me in this journey. I wanna wish you good health, well-being, happiness, and lots of love to you and your loved ones.